All right. So, like I said, the um, compound chemistry has a post specifically about glow sticks. Um, so, I just linked that one here, but just to, as an idea of what the different colors are and what the different compounds are that um, give off those colors. Basically, you can anything that will absorb colors in a certain wavelength will also emit those colors under the right conditions, right? We saw that with the emission spectra for hydrogen and, and helium and neon and things like that. Um, and we can we can kind of fine tune those if we use organic compounds, because the more of these double bonds that we wind up. If we the more of these alternating single double bonds that we have in a compound that affects the energy level of the electrons, and if you can tweak what the energy, the difference in the energy levels are, we can tweak what wavelength of light gets absorbed or emitted. So basically, that's why you see that really, really commonly. So just a whole bunch of what they call conjugated pi bonds in these chromophores. Um, and by making them either bigger or smaller, it tweaks that wavelength. Um, and so the reason that they start glowing when you break that the little glass capsule inside is because you start a reaction that gives off a whole bunch of energy really quickly, which normally would just be exothermic. You would just feel it getting warmer. Um, which is great if you want instant hand warmers, but not so great if you want a glow stick. But if you put that reaction next to some of these compounds, then the fastest way for the for the reaction to get rid of that energy is actually to promote an electron to a higher energy level, which then it falls back down and you give off a photon. So it's basically by having a, a specific exothermic reaction um, happening next to these specific dyes, it creates photons and allows it to glow, which is really similar to how bioluminescence works as well. It's just that the cells use NADH or NADPH as the, their high energy electron carriers, which then do the same exact thing, though. They promote an electron, then let it fall back down. And when it falls back down, it glows. Um, and they, instead of using these particular compounds for bioluminescence, the, um, the organisms usually use a protein based. Uh, compound, so it's going to be a lot larger than these, but it'll have the same electronic properties of having the wavelength or having the, the energy change between two different energy levels such that when an electron falls down, it gives off a photon. Um, so, and I believe that they actually invented glue sticks and luminol is the classic one, which isn't up here. Um, but that luminol effectively is uh, was one of the first things that they did this with, and they, I think they knew about that before they knew about um, fluorescent proteins. Um, so that this actually was unconsciously mimicking um, what happens biologically to achieve a similar effect. Sometimes we look at biology and say, how can we do this similarly in a lab? Like artificial photosynthesis is a good example. They're trying to design lots of ways that we can take sunlight and turn it into like a fuel or sugar or something like that without involving plants. And we're kind of mimicking plants photosynthesis when we do that. In this case, we didn't mimic biology. It just kind of worked out that biology had figured out how to do this a long time before chemistry did. Not biologists. Don't, don't get it twisted. Biologists still didn't know what was going on either. But biology figured it out. Um, so I thought that was a fun question since I had a ready figure to look at there, and we've talked a lot about orbitals. Um, this top question is actually relevant to what we've been talking about, and there are a few of you who asked questions about polarity and why polarity matters in terms of these compounds. Why do we care about it? Um, compounds with polar bonds aren't necessarily more stable, although now that we've talked about oxidation state and electronegativity, we can think about it and basically Polar bonds are more stable sometimes because it allows the most electronegative elements full access to those electrons, which is usually the most stable thing to do is to give those electronegative elements uh, all the electrons that they want. So with, in that respect, polar compounds with polar bonds are slightly more stable. Um, but the biggest difference it makes is that in between the forces in between the molecules. So we've got forces like covalent bonds and ionic bonds that hold the molecules together, but then we also have what we call intermolecular forces. 
And those intermolecular forces are basically when you have attractive forces between two different molecules. So we have a bunch of water molecules floating around. Each of them is going to be have the forces that hold it together, but then they're going to have the separate, slightly weaker forces where you have the partial negative from the oxygen being attracted to the partial positive on the hydrogen. And when you have those attractive forces, that changes things like phase transitions. So basically, things that are polar tend to have higher boiling points and higher melting points because they're being held together more strongly by these intermolecular forces. Intermolecular forces are still present in nonpolar molecules, but they're not nearly as strong. Um, and so we can tie polarity of a molecule to some, some pretty important macroscopic properties like that as well. Um, and that's why, for instance, CO2 has polar bonds, but it's not a polar molecule, and it evaporates, it sublimates, that's solid and dry ice, um, evaporates around, was it negative, negative 70? No, negative 40 Celsius. Um, versus water, which is polar, and has polar bonds, which evaporates at, well, boils at, um, which is really the same thing. In other words, we're saying the same thing at 100 Celsius, right? So, and that can all be tied back to that these intermolecular forces and polarity. So, this is one of the reasons why that's pretty important to talk about polarity. And let me make sure that works. Okay, so that is. Stop talking while it's doing that. Um, cool. Um, let's see, we'll do one more, we'll do one more for now, um, we'll just talk about CRISPR since I have, have it linked already, um, somebody asked about using CRISPR for plants and animals, and would it be beneficial, and does CRISPR change everything we know about genes, so if you haven't heard of CRISPR, CRISPR is actually what won the Nobel Prize in chemistry in 2020, I think, um, was the scientist who discovered how to use CRISPR for genetic modification. And it's not really, a, it was not so much a scientific breakthrough as it was more of an engineering breakthrough. Um, as a group that was studying bacteria and how bacteria respond to um, viral infections noticed that certain bacteria um, developed an immune system within the own, a single cell bacterium by basically taking a little bit of the viral DNA and inserting it into its own genome. So in a certain spot that allowed it to be recognized viral DNA is foreign and allowed it to destroy it. Um, and so the, the group that was studying this then thought, well, what if we change what spot, what if we change a little bit of the sequence so that instead of looking for the specific sort of viral DNA catalog within the genome, it could look in other places and cut it and insert G um, DNA. And so the the um, actual technological advance. Was it actually for just figuring out that they could already and use an already existing um, enzyme called Cas9, and that Cas9, if they if they designed what they call the guide RNA to tell Cas9 where to cut, they could effectively chop a DNA, a double helix, right in half, um, wherever this code, this guide RNA, matched up with it, and so that. And then when you cut DNA in half, the cell naturally tries to take those ends and reattach them. And but if you happen, it's not very good at that. And so if you happen to have some foreign DNA around when it does that, there's a decent chance that that foreign DNA gets incorporated where that cut was made. It's not perfect. It's not it doesn't happen every time. So we're relying on probability in the in the the proteins that are already present in these cells to do their jobs properly. And they don't have thinking minds or anything like that. Basically, 
if you, there's a protein that is able to latch on to an un, a broken piece of DNA and another broken piece of DNA and stick them together. And if broken piece of DNA and then you grab the second piece is a foreign piece of DNA, it will attach them together. And so that, that allows us to edit the genome pretty in a pretty controlled way, as long as we can um, sequence the genome, which is pretty trivial these days, and then make a guide RNA piece, tell it where we want it to cut, we can cut DNA any spot in particular with a really high degree of specificity. Um, so what does that mean for the future? It means it doesn't, we already have the ability to edit genomes. We just had to use it using an are doing using a different class of enzymes called endonucleases that are not nearly as specific as to where they cut. So it was a little bit more of a scatter shot shotgun approach where we're going to cut off DNA in a whole bunch of pieces. And then when the when it gets put back together, we hope everything still works and our new DNA is incorporated. This just gives us more specificity. Um, and so is that going to be a good thing or a bad thing in the long term? Well, I don't know. It's just the technology, right? And technology can be good or it can be bad, depending on how it's used. Um, there's a lot of dangerous potential uses for CRISPR in terms of editing uh, genes. There's also a lot of benefits to it. For instance, there's um, a type of rice that was genetically modified to have um, vitamin A in it, it's, uh, which gives it sort of a yellow color. It looks like saffron rice um, or paella rice. Um, and that that is then widely distributed in third world countries that have malnutrition problems with vitamin A. Um, and so then they can, but those cultures already knew how to grow rice. All we did was sub out this genetically modified rice. And now all of a sudden they don't have this missing vitamin in their diet. Um, so it allows for better nutrition. So that's always sort of a classic success story of genetic modification because it was done altruistically and done for good purposes. Um, and then on the flip side, you have, you know, Monsanto, um, which is genetically modifying plants, increase crop yields, but then doing it for their own benefit by selling those seeds and owning the genetic information, um, which is its own set of, of issues, but more on the philosophical or the economics side of things. Um, but it's not really that the science is bad or doing anything incorrect. It's the way it's being used. Again, and now we're getting to my speculative opinion, but um, yeah. I'd be happy to talk economics of, of uh, and the ethics of owning genetic information with anybody who's interested. Do you have a question? Do you think they'll ever use it on humans? Or? I mean, it, it seems likely at some point, this is the, probably the first case in recorded history where scientists and engineers upon discovering a new technology haven't rushed ahead of thing with things too fast for their own good. Um, everybody's being very, very cautious about using genetic modification technologies on humans um, and even on ver in ver or, uh, vertebrates in general, because it's sort of a Pandora's box and it could worsen existing inequities and things like that. Um, so it's, I feel like it's likely to happen at some point if it hasn't already happened secretly. Um, but it's, I don't necessarily know where I stand on that, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Ronnie? Then you can make like clones or hybrids. Yes, we can already do clones. People are pretty, we haven't been cloning humans for the same reason. Biologists have all gotten together and agreed, hey, this is probably not a door we want to open um, at this point until we've thought about it more thoroughly, which again, great job science for the first time. We're actually being responsible with something like that. Um, until there was that one guy in China who claimed he used genetic modification to um, alter or to implant genetically modified zygotes in women in China. But I don't know if they ever proved. And then there was widespread outcry. It was a huge issue. I don't know if that ever actually anything came of that, if the, any of those fetuses ever came to term or anything like that. Um, but it's kind of already, in theory, it's been done. Somebody has talked about doing it and said they did it, whether or not they actually did. Um, that guy then got immediately blacklisted worldwide from anything to do with any scientific research um, because of such a um, not getting permission to do something that is both groundbreaking and really dangerous. Um, so it's a, it's its own thing. And CRISPR is just a better way of doing it. It's a big deal, but 
it's not really anything that we haven't been doing from this since the 70s, really. Do they like use CRISPR for like the elements or no? So basically, it just allows you to change the genetic code by inserting your own genetic code wherever it cuts. So we're not really adding new, incorporating new elements. If you did something like incorporate a totally foreign molecule and manage to like put it in the middle of the genetic code by doing that, you're just going to kill the organism, um, the, the cell where it tries to do that, because now all of a sudden you've got something that the rest of the cell's machinery can't do anything with um, in the middle of, of this genetic code that it needs to access on a regular basis. Will so, this be able to be weaponized, such as like in a gas, being able to alter somebody's code and then replace it with the so this is so altering a, a multicellular creature's DNA as they're living is actually what's called uh, gene therapy, not genetic modification. This all happens at a single cellular level. So this has to happen at the when a when a uh, multicellular creature is still in the single stage level. Um, and so it's really not something that you could you could damage like a whole person that way because our genetic code is already set once we're born. Um, so with that in mind, it's not really something you could use that way. There are approaches that could could be weaponized to do things like gene therapy or beneficially to do gene therapy by doing things like fixing the damaged code, um, the mutated genes that cause say cystic fibrosis. Um, by by introducing fixed genetic codes, fixed genes into a living, a fully developed person, um, but that's actually that's further away and less common. And again, a whole bag of ethical worms that you're opening up with that. Um, so that's that's still a little bit more science fiction than actual science at this point. All right, one more, and then we're going to move on. What is stem cells? So. Stem cells, what makes them stem cells is that they can develop into a variety of different tissue cells. Um, if you give them different sort of chemical um, cues, basically, chemical messages to tell a stem cell to develop into a nerve cell versus a, um, a bone marrow cell versus something else. Um, and so I don't know if there's a whole lot of research that's been done on modifying the genetic code of stem cells. Usually we're trying to do the opposite and take already existing cells and make them behave like stem cells so that people can can heal, say, you know, the nerve damage from a broken neck or something like that. Um, so I don't know if they've done a lot of work on editing or any work really on editing the genome of stem cells specifically. Um, have to look into that. That's that's actually something that I had never thought about. Um, <laughs> But then again, I don't live on the microbiology side of things, so Carl might be a better one to ask about that, or Omran when uh, when you meet him in the winter. All right, and those other three questions we'll talk about at some point, depending on on uh, what's going on. Let's do a couple of practice problems and talk about stoichiometry a little bit, and then we'll take a break in a few minutes. So this is one where I, I promised we'd start with it this time. I went ahead and removed the solution that it was already left over from last time in there. All right, so when balancing combustion reactions, there's these, despite the fact you can run into an issue with an odd number of oxygens versus an even number of oxygens, these are actually usually pretty easy to balance when you get the hang of things because we can balance the carbons and the hydrogens fairly easily because we only make one product with, each, with carbon in it and one product with hydrogen in it. So all it takes to balance these when it comes to the carbon and the hydrogen is, well, how many carbons we have over here. That has to be how many CO2s we make on the other side, right? <laughs> so 
So we put a one there. We gotta put a three there to balance our carbons, right? And if we have eight hydrogens on the left, we need to use eight hydrogens on the right. And all of our hydrogens have to get turned into water. And every water has two hydrogens. So that means we can make a total of four waters. So all that's left now is oxygen. And now we can balance the oxygens without changing anything else. If I put a number in front of the oxygens, it's not going to mess up the balancing I already did for carbons and hydrogens. Really, the, the balancing, reaction balancing that's the hardest is when everything has more than one element in it. And if I if I changing this, I'm going to throw off the stuff I already did for one of the other elements. But because oxygen is just all by itself, we can change that number without messing with the hydrogens and the carbons, right? Um, so with that in mind, you look over here and see six oxygens and then another four oxygen. So total of 10 oxygen atoms. Five. Therefore, we need five, exactly. Five O2s. And just a little bit more practice to remind ourselves how these conversions work. How do we get to number of mole in five pounds of propane? What's the only way we know how to get to number of moles at this point anyway? Conversions. Conversions, grams. So I guess it's not, I can't say that anymore because we added concentration, right? Concentration is another way to get to moles of something. But in this case, we have a mass. We have a mass. We're just going to put it in grams, then use the molecular weight to get from grams to moles, right? So five pounds. Let's say it's 5.0, so we get to keep two sig figs. And one pound is 453.59 grams. Then it's just a matter of finding our molecular weight of propane. This is the other one that's 44, isn't it? So CO2 and propane both have a molecular weight of really close to 44, 44.0 something. In this case, 0 .0, uh, 0 0.01, one? No, one, one, nine. 44.097. What happens when I just try to treat it like they're each 0 0.01? So three times mass of carbon, which is 12.011, plus eight times mass of hydrogen, which is 1.0078. And that'll give us moles of propane. So just a little review. The reason that this is a relevant review question right now in, is because this, the rest of this lecture is all about why we do everything in moles for chemistry instead of doing things in grams or doing things in milliliters or something like that that's easier to measure. Because if I have one pound of propane or five pounds of propane that has that molecular weight, I can't necessarily use that to figure out how many grams of CO2 I make directly, right? But if I know how many molecules of uh, propane I have, and I know that every one molecule of propane, when it reacts, makes three molecules of CO2, the act of balancing means we know what the relative amounts are as long as we're in moles or atoms or molecules. We can't convert and say five grams of propane is this many grams of CO2, but we can say this many gram or this many moles of propane, one mole of propane is three moles of CO2 because we're counting objects, we're counting number of molecules instead of just looking at the mass. The fact that every molecule has its own mass is what means we can't just compare grams to grams directly. Right? And so that process 
of using these balancing coefficients to figure out how much of something else we can make is called stoichiometry, which is a really big, scary word for a really easy concept once we get used to the idea of balancing reactions. All right, so stoichiometry is just a conversion. It's a conversion that says one molecule or one mole of propane makes three moles of CO2. When I say makes, that implies equals, right? And if we can say one mole of propane equals three moles of CO2, we can write that as a conversion. And now we can cancel out moles of propane and be left in moles of something else. Right? And so I'm going to start by doing this with, uh, with a macroscopic example, since chemicals are hard to, are really abstract and hard to wrap your head around sometimes. All right, so bear with me if this seems like I'm condescending or pandering. I'm not trying to. I'm just going to present a really, really obvious example using food and recipes that then we're going to translate that into the more abstract idea of do, using it for chemicals. All right, so don't pay no attention to that yet. If you're getting a cheeseburger at home, pick your food of choice. I'm going to use a cheeseburger um, because it has a discrete number of ingredients, right? If we're making a cheeseburger, we need a few key ingredients. We need a patty or else it's not a cheeseburger, right? We need cheese, or else it's not a cheeseburger. And we need a bun, but let's just call it bread so we can count it in pieces of bread when it comes to, to balancing. And so if these are our ingredients, we can define them. Let's treat it like those are atomic symbols. We're going to write this recipe out like it's a uh, chemical reaction. And we can effectively just say, okay, well, a patty plus cheese plus bread turns into a hamburger. Now it's not really balanced yet because we could put different, and we don't need just one piece of bread. Let's assume we're going with classic cheeseburger, only one patty. But I'm, I'm a bit of a sucker for cheese. So I always put at least two pieces of cheese on my cheeseburgers, right? making your own cheeseburger, you might as well make it worth your time. So if we're balancing this, we say, well, okay, well, one patty, two pieces of cheese, and two pieces of bread makes one hamburger. Easy enough, right? All I did was do something we all know how to do and wrote it like it's a chemical equation. What if I have if I have 12 hamburger patties, how many hamburgers can I make? 12, right? If I have, if I wanted to write that as a math, as a conversion, it'd be a really simple conversion to write, but I could say, okay, well, if I've got 12 patties and every one patty makes one hamburger. Easy enough, right? Again, something that you know how to do intuitively, but now we could show our work a certain way for it. If I have, if I have 18 pieces of cheese, how many hamburgers can I make? Nine, right? We could write that the same way. And now, now mathematically, it actually makes a bit of a difference because we have that two in front of the pieces of cheese, right? If I have 18 pieces of cheese and every two pieces of cheese, is one hamburger. Cheese cancels out with cheese and I'm left in hamburgers, right? Really straightforward when we're doing it for something like a hamburger. Of course, that using the um, Using that example, it kind of depends on if I say we have 18 pieces of cheese, how many hamburgers can we make? That depends on how many patties we have too, right? 
So we kind of have to keep an eye on all of our ingredients unless we make an assumption like we're not going to run out of something. We're not going to, we have so much bread, we don't even know what to do with it. We definitely don't need to worry about bread. And, and if you've ever gone to a barbecue with a bunch of friends and everybody brings a different ingredient, bread's always what you have left over at the end, right? It's cheap. It keeps well. Somebody's always willing to pitch in the hole. $2.50 to bring a giant bag of buns, right? right? Um, but sometimes we do have more than one limitation. If we have one package of bread, which is 16 slices, and one package of patties, which is 10 patties, how many hamburgers can we make? <laughs> right, so we can make eight hamburgers from the bread. Bread and we can make 10 hamburgers, we use all the, the patties, right? It can't be both of those answers. And we can't add them up. We can't, we're not going to say we have enough bread to make eight hamburgers and we have enough patties to make 10, therefore we can make 18 hamburgers. That'd be silly, right? I use this as an example because this happens every time I teach this subject. People will figure out how many you have enough you know, propane to make this much CO2 and you have enough oxygen to make this much CO2 and then they'll add the numbers together. No, because we're using them both up at the same time for this to happen, right? Mm -hmm. So when we fig figure out how much we can make from each of the ingredients, whatever number is the smallest number has to be the real answer, right? Again, things that are really, really obvious and intuitive when it's a hamburger, but get tricky when it's not. So let's do this with a reaction. If we have aluminum plus bromine makes aluminum bromide. Start by balancing the reaction. And then let's figure out how many moles of aluminum. Well, and we'll answer these questions. We'll go through them one at a time. So we start with this, just balancing. An even number of bromines on the left-hand side and an odd number on the right-hand side. So what do we have to do? Two. We know we've got to have at least two of these. And if we have two aluminum bromides, we've got to have at least two aluminums, right? Now we've got a total of six bromides on the right. Three. So we can solve this, balance it rather by putting a three in front of the bromine. Now, same logic is going to apply to this as applied to the hamburgers we just talked about. If I have three moles of bromine, how many moles of aluminum do I need to use that up? Let's see how people are saying too. We can show that by saying, okay, well, I know I can write a conversion. Mathematically, you can't just look at it and say, it's gotta be two. Mathematically, we wanna show our work. Why is it two? And it's because, well, for every three moles of bromine used, there's two moles of aluminum used. And because that's what this balancing does. The fact that it's now balanced allows us to write these conversions, these stoichiometry conversions. And all there is to it is you just look at what the coefficients are. If you balanced it properly, all you do is you just take the coefficients, say three moles of bromine, it's two moles of aluminum. We can add descriptive terms um, kind of as, as you need to. Sometimes we talk about used, sometimes we talk about needed, sometimes we talk about produced. The main thing is that whatever is a reactant is being used up. Whatever is a product is being made. Right? If 
go back to the hamburger analogy, if I said, okay, I used 18 pieces of cheese, therefore I used, I wouldn't say, therefore I used nine hamburgers, right? I made the hamburgers because it's the product. I'm using the reactants. And literally, that step is all there is to stoichiometry. Everything in stoichiometry is just balance the reaction and figure out how to get everything that you have into moles. And once you're into moles, you can do these steps. Okay. But it's this easy? No. Not really. But as soon as it's a number that's not as easy to wrap your head around, I picked three moles makes that really easy, right? Well, what if it's not three moles? If it's one mole of aluminum, how many moles of bromine do we need? Three. Again, you can do this intuitively, but as soon as it gets like this, it gets a little bit easier to, to divide when you were supposed, supposed to multiply, right? So it's never a bad idea to show this step. If we have 1.0 moles of aluminum, and every two moles of aluminum is three moles of bromine used or needed or however you want to describe it. Moles of aluminum cancels out moles of aluminum. We're left in moles of bromine. 1.5. And again, you could keep that same used, or in, in this case, the way the questions breaks kind of dictates what qualitative words we would use. It doesn't say how many moles of bromine are used up. It says how many are required. So we might say required or needed or something like that. But basically, the main thing is keeping track of if it's a reactant that's being used up and if it's a product that's being produced. So let's talk about products. I'm going to blank the screen out so I can write it larger. If we are trying to make 8.51 moles of aluminum bromide, and I remember the 8.51, I don't remember what it asked about. It asked about how many moles of uh, bromine are required. Yeah. yeah. And we want to find out needed or used. But a lot of times when I set up these problems, it's a good idea to write out your reaction, make sure it's balanced, and then take, if it's presented as a word problem, immediately take any amounts of any specific substances and write them underneath whatever substance they correspond to. That way, just as a way of sort of organizing your thoughts. And then that allows you to then say, okay, and what am I trying to get to? I'm trying to, in this case, I want moles of bromine. But the steps are then identical. It doesn't matter what we're asking about or what we're starting from. You still are just taking the coefficients and writing a conversion factor with it. So 8.51 moles of aluminum bromide required, made, however you want to describe it, produced, and for every Two moles of aluminum bromide. Three moles of bromine needed. All right, a word of warning. When you're writing these down fast or feeling lazy and not wanting to write all that out, it's tempting to just leave off moles when you do this. If you do that, you don't get that red flag that says, oh, wait, I'm in grams and I need to be in moles before this works. So because it has to be in moles, 
Technically, you could do it in molecules as well if you wanted to. If you wanted to use Avogadro's number to go up with individual molecules, the same conversions apply, right? But you pretty much never do that. So, but you generally, you pretty much always need to write moles for, for these because we need to show um, that we're in moles. You need to remind yourself. And in this case, this is another just another example. It'd be really easy if you were trying to do this mentally to have the two and the three flipped um, because you just look at this and say, oh, it's a two and a three, it's two thirds, when really it's three halves. All right, so write it out, even if you think you know how to do it. But the only one that you don't have to write out is if it's a straight two to one ratio and you can look at it and just double it in your head. It's still a good idea, though. Right until you get to the point where you don't, you, there's no possible way you could be mixing it up by doing it in your head. So, in this case, we're going to divide this by two, so 4.256, and then we're going to multiply by three, so 12. Point. Easy enough, right? Straightforward conversions. What about our sig figs on these? I haven't really done anything with the sig figs there. Did you start with 8.51? We started with 8.51, but did the two and the three have sig figs attached to them? No, they're exact. They're exact? Why? Where did they come from? Balancing, balancing right? And how do we balance? by counting with integers, right? It's not about two aluminums. It's exactly two aluminums because we're making exactly two aluminums. So these are always exact in chemistry. Again, geologists get weird with their all their weirdness. And well, there's between 1.25 and 2 um, aluminum atoms in this crystal structure, depending on the sample. Um, we're not going to mess with any of that. Our balancing is exact. All right, we're going to take our break, but I'm going to let you marinate on this question. We're going to go back to our, our cheeseburger analogy. If you buy a quarter pound of cheese and one pound of hamburger meat, how many hamburgers can you make? Think about that when you take your 10 minute break, come back to 10 after. Well, my downfall happened with my husband decided to file for it before. So if you got a topper on that, just, uh, you let me know. I don't think you'll find anything that gets ahead of that. Unfortunately. <laughs> Downfalls already happened. Yeah. I love that you have some acids. Yeah, so because you're not, that's not going to be a solid. It's ammonia in that. Soluble, no exceptions, right? 
Um, you know something. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so I think we have the two weeks that actually donate an H plus to the hydroxyl three all together, but it's two base reaction. So if I take an H plus right here, and H four plus turns into an H three, and then we're done. And then we have O H minus. Can we give it an H plus? So for any acid base reactions, we look at it and say, okay, but seven is not a uh, yeah, well, I'm sure he does too. <laughs> and you try to write it down. Oh, really? So, uh, well, I'm already that doing that. It doesn't have to change anything. Again, change. you still can't get the hang, get the hang of it. Yeah. 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 Um, the change about that, we'll talk after after class. Sure. That's still okay. something that you're. I'll just show yeah. it. Yeah, just uh, right. yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 You got nothing. You got nothing to worry about. Uh, uh, what? How do you think you did, Gary? Awesome. Thank you. But that's going to be assigned tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. It's a good year. Yeah. 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 I just wrote it down as I knew a girl. I wasn't paying attention for it. You've done like three seconds. <laughs> Well, I mean, whatever. I mean, it's really a small crush it. Well, I crushed it last year. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I'm getting better, get better. <laughs> Well, he taught me a lot. What <laughs> <laughs> I got to laugh about it. It's fine. I'm not heartbroken. I'm not heartbroken. <laughs> I'm totally fine with that. <laughs> Yeah, Sean. Yeah. So next 
for the winter term, it's like hybrid. Yeah. Yeah. Is that going to stay that way, or is it going to turn to face? We'll we'll talk about that in a second because everybody's going to have that question. So give me give me a second for everybody to get So yeah. So right. That Oh my gosh, it's still on me again. Oh, you actually Oh, yeah, he dropped very fast. Oh, wow, you've actually met my ex. It's crazy too young. It's like he. So it's like I hate this more than anything because it's like well it could go it could go this way or it could go that way but I don't know so I have to sit here. I'd rather do and there's like a part of it that's like I'm kind of glad that he doesn't know because then that's still pops, you know. Like I'm he's still going to play so he will never ever admit it or anything like that. Yeah, we'll see. Oh, girl. I think you're right. Yeah. Drowning with that. Oh, I can't wait to see my season finale. Fuck. Well, the next episode is the snowstorm and watching my dainty ass fucking try to snow blow the fucking entire cabin. It'll be the content for the episode. You can jump into my mess if your life gets to I can like spice it up real quick. <laughs> Tell me about it, Mom. Just tell me about it. Oh, how I wish things could be boring. We'll be mad at each other. I was talking to my friend about it. She's like, I was like, you know what? Like, I'm actually pretty awesome. Like, I'm. I was talking to her. Like, you know, like, I'm not going to think of that. We'll be like, all right, I'm not going to be here until that. It is what it is. Awesome the way go. You never find a thing. All right. Let's do it the opposite. A couple of quick notes about Chem 102. Since it's registration season. Um, so, Camp 102 is going to look a little bit different because I'm not going to be here. Um, the labs will still be just as they are right now, except um, there'll be a, a woman named Millie who helps set up all of the um, labs for us. Um, at the beginning of the quarter, she'll be the lab instructor. Um, and then the lecture instructor will be a man named Omron. Um, and it'll be distance it'll be on a zoom lecture it'll still be scheduled at the same time so it'll be like the zoom classes that we did during covid where you have a set lecture time um, but it's just on zoom rather than in person um so at this point i don't 
I need to double check whether they're going to um, like schedule it in a room. Like if you guys are going to still come here and put put Omron up on the board here, or if it's just going to be like like Braille lecture where everybody logs in from their own um, computer. Um, there'll probably be a little bit of both. If you're not here in person, you're able to log in to Zoom, but they'll also have some sort of in-person um, setup for people who don't have good internet connection or a, a laptop to use. Um, so it will be it will be different. Omron's great. Um, I have not met him in person, but I've talked, chatted with him on Zoom several times. He's a PhD in biochemistry from, I think, UC Riverside, maybe one of the UCs in the, um, in Southern California. Um, so he really knows his stuff. He's a really good teacher. He's, um, I'm going to meet with him and talk about the structure of the class, try and keep it as close to the structure of this class as possible since everybody's already used to it. Um, and so with that in mind, it, nothing should change that much. Um, but it will, it shows up on when you register as being an Eve class that whatever they called it, I've now forgotten the acronym, something virtual education. Um, that'll what it'll be listed as, but the labs will still be in person, same time slots, same lab sections, and the lectures will still be scheduled at the same time, just through Zoom, um, as well as um, we'll have some sort of setup for, for people who wanna be here and, and um, watch it you know, collaboratively. Um, that's that would still be the, the same setup that way. Um, and that'll be the same for 103. So any any questions about how that's going to work? I'll do my best to answer them. I can't guarantee I have answers yet, um, but I will answer to the best of my ability. How will testing be done? Good question. We'll probably have everybody come to this room and have a proctor sit here and give the test so it'll look just like this, um, just like we've been doing. Um, and then, and if you if you have testing accommodations or anything like that, it'll still go through the the um, student services, student accommodation services. Um, any any other you had a question? Instructor going to use the same uh, material that you're that you would have used for the entire. Yeah. So it'll be. I mean, Gen Chem is Gen Chem is Gen Chem. It's the same series no matter where you take it. The Gen Chem at Berkeley is the same Gen Chem we have here. Maybe even these. There's only like ten textbooks that that get used anyway. So um, it'll still be the same textbook you're using. It'll still be the same material. The order might change a little bit from what I would normally do, but it'll still be all the same stuff. And it'll be like the same module with like the way the test is worth and the assignments and all that. So I can't guarantee that because that's that's his decision, but I'm gonna it'll be fairly similar. I'm willing to bet because um, instructors know that it's no fun to totally change up in the middle of the series. Um, so he might be a little bit of tweaks here and there, like you know, tests are worth 35% or 25% instead of 30%, but it'll look a lot like what we have so far. I'm pretty confident. Um, I can't guarantee that because it's somebody else's decision on the final say, um, but that's that's generally what people do when we have to split in the middle of a uh, series. Anyone else? Are you going to be back for spring or no? I will not be here for spring as well. I'm, I will be on campus a little bit for the spring, but I will not be teaching. Um, this is just happened to work out this way because of when my Son was born in September. My wife took off the whole fall quarter um, to do parental leave. And then um, for the first time in my life, I actually had enough sick leave accrued uh, and the ability to take some time off for parental leave as well. So I'm going to be Mr. Mom at home um, for the winter quarter. And then my sabbatical project was already scheduled for the spring. So I'm not trying to abandon you. Um, but at the same time, I've got a little guy at home and daycare is really expensive. Um, so I'll be at home checking my email, working on projects, but I won't be teaching for the, uh, for the winter and the spring quarters. Um, you coming back next fall? Or? I'll be back next fall. Um, no, trust me, I will be ready to come back in about mid-February. <laughs> uh, next fall, uh, um, will be, I'll be back and I will probably be teaching OCAM. So I'll see any of you who are taking OCAM, um, next, in the next fall for, for Chem 221. Uh, 
Sorry, that's good. There's going to be a different lab instructor here. On yes. So, so is she going to be the one grading us? Are we still going to transfer everything from him to be graded? I need to work that out with them. Um, typically, the way it works is the lab instructor will grade the labs, but it, but she'll also have access to the Canvas shell. So it will probably look the same as far as you could turn it in in paper or you could turn it in digitally. Um, but but she will be the one grading the labs. Um, and then Amran will be the one grading. They'll they'll work that out between them whether she also grades the ICAs or if all the ICAs are digital and he grades them on campus. Um, okay. Yeah, that that's that's so they they have to decide. But usually that's Millie would be doing it. the assignments that are assigned during lab. Millie will grade those typically. Any other questions? I know it's weird. I know it's different and not necessarily what you thought you were signing up for. Um, it's just kind of how everything fell into place. Um, but you're going to be fine. And if things get wildly out of hand, Carl will still be here and I'll still be checking my email. If you need to get a hold of me for some reason, um, Carl will be the, the department chair while I'm gone. And, um, you know, any, any sort of issues you're having with the way it's structured you can go to instruction or send me an email and and um i'll talk to and make sure that that we're taking care of y'all not just abandoning you um it just feels like that <laughs> i've never done this before either so i'm really weirded out by this too i only have like three more weeks of work before i don't have work for nine months and that's weird anyway that makes you much better Exactly. I got to get the brewery set back up again and, um, you know, make my money that way. All right, let's, let's go back to this. Um, I put our balanced hamburger patty equation up at the top. If we buy, if we measure how much we buy in terms of pounds, that's going to mess with how we try to use these conversions, right? It's not one pound of patty and one pound of cheese equals one hamburger, right? So if we're looking at it like this, we have to first take an amount in mass and turn it into how many objects we have, right? So just like taking grams of a compound and turning it to moles of a compound. The first step with these is always get it into moles, or in this case, get it into slices. But we have to have more information to do that. So in this case, we're just going to kind of make it up. What, uh, what's a conversion we could use for pounds of cheese to slices of cheese? There's not a wrong answer. I mean, there, there are lots of wrong answers, but there's they're all valid for, for the sake of uh, this thought experiment. You can say one slice is 0 0.05. One slice is 0 0.05. Or if we didn't want to deal with decimals, we could rewrite that as... 20 pieces of cheese is one pound. That seems pretty reasonable, right? Maybe even on the, that's, those are kind of thick slices. Maybe I think, you know, those, those pre-sliced packs that you get from the deli are like, it's like six ounces of cheese and it's about 10 slices. But I like that one. So we can use that. Let's say that one pound of cheese is equal to 20 slices cheese and how about we're going to have a different conversion for hamburgers right because we're not getting 20 hamburger patties out of a pound of ground beef what do we get maybe two or three depends on how you make your, your hamburger patties right but the classic would be a quarter pounder right so that'd be that'd be four patties per pound um, but I like three. Let's, the three makes the math more interesting, right? So let's say 1.0 pounds of patty is equal to three, three slices, three patties. So with this information, how many hamburgers can we make? Three. We have enough slices of cheese to make how many? Uh, it's a little hard to do in our head, so let's show our work. We have 0.25 pounds, and for every one pound is 20 slices. 
and two slices. I didn't write cheese. So let me make sure I say that. And one hamburger. So 0.25 times 20 is five divided by two. 2.5 hamburgers, which sounds a little bit weird, but let's just leave it there because we kind of understand what that's what that's showing. And then if we use up all of our hamburger, that's pounds of hamburger, and for every one pound is three patties, right? I mix, I mix this up. This is not supposed to be HB, right? That's PA is three patties. So we have enough patties. Got to show that, show the work for that last one, even though it's one to one. Because one patty is one hamburger. So we have enough patties to make three hamburgers, but we only have enough cheese to make two and a half hamburgers following our recipe. Let's, let's put aside the fact that if you have five slices of cheese, you, you could still make three hamburger, three cheeseburgers out of that. Um, but following our recipe, we only have enough cheese to make two cheeseburgers this way, right? Could we spruce this up? Okay. By adding how much stomach acid you need, is all of this. That gets actually much more complicated because that's a buffered system. But I like where your head's at. So when we do this, if we have two different amounts for for our reactants, we can use both of those to figure out how much product we can make. And whatever number is lower must be the real answer. We have enough patties to make three hamburgers, but we only have enough cheese to make two hamburgers. Normally, if we're talking about moles, we would be able to keep the decimal because you could have half a mole, right? But since we're talking about discrete objects here, we would then round that down because you can't make half of a hamburger. You can, but not for the sake of this really example. Clear. I do it, Matt, Derek, take your own. You can make a hamburger that's half worth eating because it has half the cheese. A happy meal, exactly. All right. Does anything change about this? If we're doing it in if we're doing the same reaction and we're doing it with chemicals. Logic's still all the same, right? If we have enough aluminum, we can figure out how many grams or how many moles of aluminum bromide we can make if we turn that into moles first. And so if you have 25 grams of aluminum, the first thing we need to do is figure out how many moles of aluminum that is. And again, Be one way to, to organize your thoughts. Here's what we have. Here's what we're trying to get to. And if it doesn't tell you anything about how much bromine you have, you can assume that you've got enough bromine. We call it excess, which we conveniently abbreviate by writing the letter X and S. So all we need to do is say, okay, well, if I've got 25 grams of aluminum, and I look on my periodic table and I find out that the atomic mass of aluminum is 27.96.98. We don't really need all those sig figs, but we have them. So might as well carry a few extra sig figs.
And once we know how many, and you could stop there and then write a number for moles of aluminum, right? Right, just underneath where you have grams written, then get something like what, 0 0.93. Three. You could also just continue from here and say, okay, if I'm trying to get to moles of aluminum bromide, I might as well just include that step too. And it helps me keep it balanced. Otherwise it doesn't work. But we can then say, okay, well, for every two moles of aluminum, I can make two moles of product of aluminum bromide. So we just added one step, we just added a molecular weight thing to the front, right? Mm -hmm. To get to moles, and then we do the same moles to moles conversion. If I want to know how many grams that was, what if I change this to how many grams of product can I make? That's just one more moles to grams conversion, right? So let's get a number for for moles here first. We're gonna, oh, sorry, it's just going to be zero point nine three, right? If I wanted that in grams, I just then go one one extra step. Zero point nine three moles of aluminum bromide, and one mole of aluminum bromide. How many grams? Bromine's really close to 80. So, like 260, something like that, right? Yeah, 265. So we'll get something, our final number for grams would be then be something like what, 250 something low. Yeah, 246. And we'd only keep three, two sig figs in this case. So we then have to round it and then use scientific notation. But for the sake of just writing it out, since we all know how to do sig figs in scientific notation, we get 246 grams of aluminum bromide. We then write it as 2.5 times 10 to the 2 grams of aluminum bromide. So, again, the only thing we haven't seen before is just that step. Easy enough, right? This is going to be at least three of the 10 problems on the final are going to be stoichiometry problems of varying difficulties. The first one's gonna be really simple. Balance this, here's how many moles you have, how much product can you make in moles? Then I'll do one more, it's a little trickier, that goes, here's how many grams you have, how many grams of product can you make? And then there'll be one that's a little bit trickier that it might involve concentrations as a way to get to moles. And, and so, if we can get the hang of this though, and just remember everything is just get it to moles and then convert moles of one thing to moles of another. All right, that's the central idea for the second half of this course. So let's practice. This is the reaction for acetylene, for combustion of acetylene. Acetylene is C2H2. And we have oxygen gas. And so when you have something, a hydrocarbon reacting with oxygen, it's what type of reaction? Combustion. Combustion, bingo. The only thing that's ever tricky about combustion is the balancing sometimes. We start with that. 
we wind up with an issue, right? Yes. So odd number of oxygens on the right hand side, but carbons and hydrogens are both balanced. So just double everything we've already balanced. And the, the carbon and hydrogen should still be balanced, right? And now we have an even number of oxygens on the right hand side. So, unless I counted wrong, that should be balanced now. Two, five, four, two. So if we start with 5.00 kilograms of acetylene, how many grams of CO2 can we make? So if we're organizing our thoughts here, 5.00 kilograms, and we're trying to get to grams of CO2. All right, does so everybody have this written down? I'm going to white out the screen so I can write bigger. I need mean, 5.00 kilograms. Grams of CO2. So first step is always get everything in moles. Because it doesn't matter that it's a balanced reaction if we can't put it in moles because it's balanced according to how many atoms we have. So 5.00 kilograms. What do we do first? One kilogram is 10 to the third grams. And then what do we do? We know it's a four to two ratio. Not yet. Okay, no, we have to get all the way to moles. We just got to grams first. So 26.04 ish grams is one mole of acetylene. And now we can do the stoichiometry step, or we could stop, hit enter on our calculator and write a number down for moles of acetylene. That's fine too. Just like with those other conversions we've been doing, you can hit enter on your calculator at any point that you want. Stop, write down the answer, and then continue on. So if we stop here, we get something like... moles of acetylene would be helpful if we're stopping in the middle. Oh, I got that formula wrong. So it would have been 26.04, would have been 26. No, it was 26.04 still. Got that part right. I just wrote it wrong. So come back here, write out 192. 0.01 moles. My personal preference would normally be I would not stop and hit enter here. I would just keep going, write it all at once. But I'm limited in my space here, and I wanted to stop and, and show um, what we actually just calculated. And now we can do moles and moles. For every one mole is 18. So you can reduce these if you want. I think it's not a great habit to simplify this down. Because even though I know that two over four reduces to two over one, it's still good to show where these numbers come from until you get really comfortable with this. Right, because when you look at your work, you want to be able to look at this and say, well, wait, where did 
four where did two over one come from? If you write it as four over two, it makes it a lot more obvious where you got those numbers. And then we can say one mole CO2. If we we're just trying to get to moles, we'd be done. If we're trying to get to grams, we just add on that one last conversion. One mole of CO2 is 44.01 grams of CO2. And I remember in my numbers, right, get something like one, like 12,000 grams, right? 169. A hundred? I got 1.69 times. That's what I got. That sounds. We started with five kilograms and we made twice as many moles of, and I did it again. I'm not. Talking too much while I'm trying to do my board work apparently today. CO2, not C2, H2. So we're making twice as many moles. So we're sitting somewhere close to 400 moles of CO2. And then we're going to multiply that by 50. So 400 times 10 would be 4,000 times another five it gives us something in that um, 16, 17,000 range. And we did have three sig figs, so we keep three sig figs. Right. Again, these these are the, the classic type of problem that are really obvious when I'm up here doing it for you. And you're bored to tears watching me work through these examples, but when you sit down with a blank piece of paper trying to do one of these, it's really easy to get lost. So just remember your first steps always balance. Your second step is always put whatever you have in moles and figure out what you're trying to get to, and then just start converting. Just on a more applied note, so five kilograms is roughly 10 pounds, right? So, and frequently you can buy acetylene gas in, you know, 15 pound tanks. Um, so that would be roughly the same size as this five kilograms we're working with here. And when you burn that, you make almost more than three times as much in terms of mass CO2. You take, you take five kilograms of acetylene, you're going to make 17 kilograms of CO2, which seems weird because there's no like solid product when you're welding something with acetylene, right? Um, it's released as a gas, but you do produce a very significant amount of CO2 by doing these, these combustion reactions if you sit and look at it because we go from something with a low atomic mass or molecular mass to something with a big molecular mass and we made a whole bunch more molecules than we started with. So it's weird to think about because it's a gas and we don't typically think about weighing gases, but you would actually make a pretty big, it would be a heavy, pretty heavy um, amount of CO2. Questions on this one? Any other mistakes that I didn't correct yet or any anything I didn't explain? How many grams of O2 are required to burn all of that? So this is just Now we're not, this second question saying, we don't care about grams of CO2 anymore. It's a separate question. So don't try to bring grams of CO2 into it. The second question is just saying grams of O2. Exact same process, except we're gonna have a different ratio. Our stoichiometry step is gonna have different numbers in it. It's not four over two, it's going to be five over two, and we're going to have a different molecular weight. But the steps are the same, right? Put this in moles. And you can reuse that number. This is actually one place where you could actually save yourself some time instead of doing it all in one big step. 
you know, you've got another question immediately after that's using the same number, then stopping writing down that number in moles could actually be, you know, a time saver. You don't have to rewrite out those conversion steps. It's not like they take that long, though, once you know what you're doing. And then you can say, okay, well, if I've got 192.01 moles of acetylene, and now it's for every two moles of acetylene, five moles of oxygen used. And then we could then take O2 and say, okay, well, one mole of O2 is thirty-one point nine nine eight grams. There's temptation when you do these problems to try and like find a shortcut like well if i made this many if i made 17 kilograms of co2 and i started with five kilograms i had to use 12 kilograms of, of oxygen don't do that because that doesn't take into account that some of your oxygen went into making water right so stop start from the beginning again if you had first figured out the total amount of water weight and then you had a total mass of product, then you could do it as a subtraction problem like that. You could write it out as an algebra step like that. But in general, your, your go-to should be, I have this much, I can put it in moles and I can do a stoichiometry step, right? That should be so natural by the time we practice this another, you know, 150 times between now and the final that you shouldn't even have to think twice about stoichiometry by the time you get to the final. And the take-home final is gonna have some stoichiometry steps on it, but the tricky part is not gonna be the stoichiometry. It's gonna either be in writing the reaction out or I can make it really tricky to get to moles. But once you get to moles, it's always the same step. The balance reaction go from there. All right, one more concept, and then we'll actually, we'll take the last five minutes, and we'll talk about um, next week. We have a break, right? We have a whole week off. Um, a whole week not think about chemistry, right? No. no. <laughs> That's not what we do. I don't want to spend a whole lecture on when we come back going over all this stuff again. So I'm going to make you think about chemistry over the break. Your ICA for week, for this week, whatever this is, nine, um, is going to be it's going to go out next week um it'll have, i'll post it as an announcement that'll it'll go out on one day i just want you to think about chemistry for at least an hour next week sometime All right so there won't be a quiz the, the day after thanksgiving there won't be a quiz this weekend your quiz this weekend is going to be do the ica but i'm not going to give it to you until probably sunday night I'll put out the announcement. Okay. Well, there's a, there's a quiz that's given this Sunday, the reaction time. I'll change that. Okay. Right. So ICA next week. Watch for the announcement. It won't be super intense. Just think about chemistry. Don't forget all this stuff. And have a good break. Okay. Yeah, this one just got a little bit tricky because because you don't really have carbonic acid. I assume that carbonic acid is those two.